Chapter 19 of Legends of Charlemagne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Kempton. Legends of Charlemagne by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 19. Rinaldo and Bayard. Charlemagne was overwhelmed with grief at the loss of so many of his bravest warriors at the disaster at Roncesvalles, and bitterly reproached himself for his credulity in resigning himself so completely to the counsels of the treacherous Count Gan. Yet he soon fell into a similar snare when he suffered his unworthy son, Charlot, to acquire such an influence over him that he constantly led him into acts of cruelty and injustice that in his right mind he would have scorned to commit. Rinaldo and his brothers, for some slight offence to the imperious young prince, were forced to fly from Paris and to take shelter in their castle of Montalban, for Charles had publicly said if he could take them he would hang them all. He sent numbers of his bravest knights to arrest them, but all without success. Either Rinaldo foiled their efforts and sent them back, stripped of their armour and of their glory, or, after meeting and conferring with him, they came back and told the king they could not be his instruments for such a work. At last Charles himself raised a great army, and went in person to compel the paladin to submit. He ravaged all the country round about Montalban, so that supplies of food should be cut off, and he threatened death to anyone who should attempt to issue forth, hoping to compel the garrison to submit for want of food. Rinaldo's resources had been brought so low that it seemed useless to contend any longer. His brothers had been taken prisoners in a skirmish, and his only hope of saving their lives was in making terms with the king. So he sent a messenger, offering to yield himself and his castle, if the king would spare his and his brothers' lives. While the messenger was gone, Rinaldo, impatient to learn what tidings he might bring, rode out to meet him. When he had ridden as far as he thought prudent, he stopped in a wood, and alighting tied Bayard to a tree. Then he sat down, and as he waited he fell asleep. Bayard, meanwhile, got loose and strayed away where the grass tempted him. Just then came along some country people who said to one another, Look, is not that the great horse Bayard that Rinaldo rides? Let us take him and carry him to King Charles, who will pay us well for our trouble. They did so, and the king was delighted with his prize, and gave them a present that made them rich to their dying day. When Rinaldo woke, he looked round for his horse, and finding him not, he groaned and said, Oh, unlucky hour that I was born! How fortune persecutes me! So desperate was he that he took off his armour and his spurs, saying, What need have I of these, since Bayard is lost? While he stood thus lamenting, a man came from the thicket, seemingly bent with age. He had a long beard overhanging his breast, and eyebrows that almost covered his eyes. He bade Rinaldo good day. Rinaldo thanked him and said, A good day I have hardly had since I was born. Then said the old man, Signor Rinaldo, you must not despair, for God will make all things turn to the best. Rinaldo answered, My trouble is too heavy for me to hope relief. The king has taken my brothers and means to put them to death. I thought to rescue them by means of my horse, Bayard, but while I slept some thief has stolen him. The old man replied, I will remember you and your brothers in my prayers. I am a poor man. Have you not something to give me? Rinaldo said, I have nothing to give. But then he recollected his spurs. He gave them to the beggar and said, Here, take my spurs. They are the first present my mother gave me when my father, Count Amon, dubbed me knight. They ought to bring you ten pounds. The old man took the spurs and put them into his sack and said, Noble sir, have you nothing else you can give me? Rinaldo replied, Are you making sport of me? I tell you truly, if it were not for shame to beat one so helpless, I would teach you better manners. The old man said, Of a truth, sir, if you did so, you would do a great sin. If all had beaten me, of whom I have begged, I should have been killed long ago for I ask alms in churches and convents and wherever I can. You say true, replied Rinaldo. If you did not ask, none would relieve you. The old man said, True, noble sir, 
therefore, I pray, if you have anything more to spare, give it me. Rinaldo gave him his mantle and said, Take it, pilgrim. I give it you for the love of Christ, that God would save my brothers from a shameful death, and help me to escape out of King Charles's power. The pilgrim took the mantle, folded it up, and put it into his bag. Then a third time he said to Rinaldo, Sir, have you nothing left to give me that I may remember you in my prayers? Wretch! exclaimed Rinaldo. Do you make me your sport? And he drew his sword and struck at him. But the old man warded off the blow with his staff and said, Rinaldo, would you slay your cousin Malagigi? When Rinaldo heard that, he stayed his hand and gazed doubtingly on the old man, who now threw aside his disguise and appeared to be indeed Malagigi. Dear cousin, said Rinaldo, pray forgive me, I did not know you. Next to God, my trust is in you. Help my brothers to escape out of prison, I entreat you. I have lost my horse, and therefore cannot render them any assistance. Malagigi answered, Cousin Rinaldo, I will enable you to recover your horse. Meanwhile, you must do as I say. Then Malagigi took from his sack a gown, and gave it to Rinaldo to put on over his armour and a hat that was full of holes, and an old pair of shoes to put on. They looked like two pilgrims, very old and poor. Then they went forth from the wood, and after a little while saw four monks riding along the road. Malagigi said to Rinaldo, I will go meet the monks, and see what news I can learn. Malagigi learned from the monks that on the approaching festival there would be a great crowd of people at court for the prince was going to show the ladies the famous horse Bayard that used to belong to Rinaldo. What, said the pilgrim, is Bayard there? Yes, answered the monks, the king has given him to Charlot, and after the prince has ridden him the king means to pass sentence on the brothers of Rinaldo and have them hanged. Then Malagigi asked arms of the monks, but they would give him none till he threw aside his pilgrim garb and let them see his armour, when, partly for charity and partly for terror, they gave him a golden cup, adorned with precious stones that sparkled in the sunshine. Malagigi then hastened back to Rinaldo and told him what he had learned. The morning of the feast day, Rinaldo and Malagigi came to the place where the sports were to be held. Malagigi gave Rinaldo his spurs back again and said, Cousin, put on your spurs, for you will need them. How shall I need them, said Rinaldo, since I have lost my horse? Yet he did as Malagigi directed him. When the two had taken their stand on the border of the field among the crowd, the princes and ladies of the court began to assemble. When they were all assembled, the king came also, and Charlot with him, near whom the horse Bayard was led in the charge of grooms, who were expressly enjoined to guard him safely. The king, looking round on a circle of spectators, saw Malagigi and Rinaldo, and observed the splendid cup that they had, and said to Charlot, See, my son, what a brilliant cup those two pilgrims have got. It seems to be worth a hundred ducats. That is true, said Charlot. Let us go and ask where they got it. So they rode to the place where the pilgrims stood, and Charlot stopped Bayard close to them. The horse snuffed at the pilgrims, knew Rinaldo, and caressed his master. The king said to Malagigi, Friend, where did you get that beautiful cup? Malagigi replied, Honourable sir, I paid for it all the money I have saved from eleven years' begging in churches and convents. The Pope himself has blessed it, and given it the power that whosoever eats or drinks out of it shall be pardoned of all his sins. Then said the king to Charlot, My son, these are right holy men. See how the dumb beast worships them. Then the king said to Malagigi, Give me a morsel from your cup that I may be cleared of my sins. Malagigi answered, Illustrious Lord, I dare not do it, unless you will forgive all who have at any time offended you. You know that Christ forgave all those who had betrayed and crucified him. The king replied, Friend, that is true, but Rinaldo has so grievously offended me that I cannot forgive him, nor that other man, Malagigi the magician. These two shall never live in my kingdom again. If I catch them, I will certainly have them hanged. But tell me, pilgrim, who is that man who stands beside you? He is deaf, dumb, and blind, said Malagigi. Then the king said again, 
Give me to drink of your cup to take away my sins. Malajiji answered, My lord king, here is my poor brother, who for fifty days has not heard, spoken, nor seen. This misfortune befell him in a house where we found shelter, and the day before yesterday we met with a wise woman, who told him the only hope of a cure for him was to come to some place where Bayard was to be ridden, and to mount and ride him. That would do him more good than anything else. Then said the king, Friend, you have come to the right place, for Bayard is to be ridden here today. Give me a draught from your cup, and your companion shall ride upon Bayard. Malajiji, hearing these words, said, Be it so. Then the king, with great devotion, took a spoon, and dipped a portion from the pilgrim's cup, believing that his sins should be thereby forgiven. When this was done, the king said to Charlot, Son, I request that you will let this sick pilgrim sit on your horse, and ride if he can, for by so doing he will be healed of all his infirmities. Charlot replied, That I will gladly do. So saying, he dismounted, and the servants took the pilgrim in their arms and helped him on the horse. When Rinaldo was mounted, he put his feet in the stirrups and said, I would like to ride a little. Malajiji, hearing him speak, seemed delighted and asked him whether he could see and hear also. Yes, said Rinaldo, I am healed of all my infirmities. When the king heard it, he said to Bishop Turpin, My lord bishop, we must celebrate this with a procession with crosses and banners, for it is a great miracle. When Rinaldo remarked that he was not carefully watched, he spoke to the horse and touched him with spurs. Bayard knew that his master was upon him, and he started off upon a rapid pace, and in a few moments was a good way off. Malajiji pretended to be in great alarm. "'O oh, noble king and master!' he cried. "'My poor companion is run away with. He will fall and break his neck.' The king ordered his knights to ride after the pilgrim and bring him back, or help him if need were. They did so, but it was in vain. Rinaldo left them all behind him and kept on his way till he reached Montalban. Malajigi was suffered to depart, unsuspected, and he went his way, making sad lamentation for the fate of his comrade, who he pretended to think must surely be dashed to pieces. Malajigi did not go far, but having changed his disguise returned to where the king was, and employed his best art in getting the brothers of Rinaldo out of prison. He succeeded and all three got safely to Montalban, where Rinaldo's joy at the rescue of his brothers and the recovery of Bayard was more than tongue can tell. End of chapter 19。Chapter 20 of Legends of Charlemagne。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy Kempton Legends of Charlemagne by Thomas Bullfinch Chapter 20 Death of Rinaldo The distress in Rinaldo's castle for want of food grew more severe every day, under the pressure of the siege. The garrison were forced to kill their horses, both to save the provision they would consume, and to make food of their flesh. At last, all the horses were killed except Bayard, and Rinaldo said to his brothers, Bayard must die, for we have nothing else to eat. So they went to the stable and brought out Bayard to kill him. But Alardo said, Brother, let Bayard live a little longer. Who knows what God may do for us? Bayard heard these words and understood them as if he was a man, and fell on his knees as if he would beg for mercy. When Rinaldo saw the distress of his horse, his heart failed him, and he let him live. Just at this time, Ea, Rinaldo's mother, who was the sister of the emperor, came to the camp, attended by knights and ladies, to intercede for her sons. She fell on her knees before the king, and besought him that he would pardon Rinaldo and his brothers, and all the peers and knights took her side, and entreated the king to grant her prayer. Then said the king, Dear sister, you act the part of a good mother, and I respect your tender heart and yield to your entreaties. I will spare your sons their lives, if they submit implicitly to my will. When Charlot heard this, he approached the king and whispered in his ear, 
and the king turned to his sister and said, Charlot must have Bayard, because I have given the horse to him. Now go, my sister, and tell Rinaldo what I have said. When the Lady Ea heard these words, she was delighted, and thanked God in her heart, and said, Worthy king and brother, I will do as you bid me. So she went into the castle, where her sons received her most joyfully and affectionately, and she told them the king's offer. Then Alardo said, Brother, I would rather have the king's enmity than give Bayard to Charlot, for I believe he will kill him. Likewise said all the brothers. When Rinaldo heard them, he said, Dear brothers, if we may win our forgiveness by giving up the horse, so be it. Let us make our peace, for we cannot stand against the king's power. Then he went to his mother, and told her they would give the horse to Charlot, and more too, if the king would pardon them, and forgive all they had done against his crown and dignity. The lady returned to Charles, and told him the answer of her sons. When the peace was thus made between the king and the sons of Amon, the brothers came forth from the castle, bringing Bayard with them, and, falling at the king's feet, begged his forgiveness. The king bade them rise, and received them into favour in the sight of all his noble knights and counsellors, to the great joy of all, especially of the Lady Ea, their mother. Then Rinaldo took the horse Bayard, gave him to Charlot, and said, My lord and prince, this horse I give to you, do with him as to you seems good. Charlot took him as had been agreed on. Then he made the servants take him to the bridge and throw him into the water. Bayard sank to the bottom, but soon came to the surface again, and swam, saw Rinaldo looking at him, came to land, ran to his old master, and stood by him as proudly as if he had understanding, and would say, Why did you treat me so? When the prince saw that, he said, Rinaldo, give me the horse again, for he must die. Rinaldo replied, My lord and prince, he is yours without dispute, and gave him to him. The prince then had a millstone tied to each foot, and two to his neck, and made them throw him again into the water. Bayard struggled in the water, looked up to his master, threw off the stones, and came back to Rinaldo. When Alardo saw that, he said, Now must thou be disgraced for ever, brother, if thou give up the horse again. But Rinaldo answered, Brother, be still. Shall I for the horse's life provoke the anger of the king again? And Alardo said, Ah, Bayard, what a return do we make for all thy true love and service. Rinaldo gave the horse to the prince again, and said, My lord, if the horse comes out again, I cannot return him to you any more, for it wrings my heart too much. Then Charlot had Bayard loaded with the stones as before, and thrown in the water, and commanded Rinaldo that he should not stand where the horse would see him. When Bayard rose to the surface, he stretched his neck out of the water, and looked round for his master, but saw him not. Then he sunk to the bottom. Rinaldo was so distressed for the loss of Bayard that he made a vow to ride no horse again all his life long, nor to bind a sword to his side, but to become a hermit. He resolved to betake himself to some wild wood, but first to return to his castle, to see his children, and to appoint to each his share of his estate. So he took leave of the king and of his brothers, and returned to Mont Alban and his brothers remained with the king. Rinaldo called his children to him, and he made his eldest-born, Aymeric, a knight, and made him lord of his castle and of his land. He gave to the rest what other goods he had, and kissed and embraced them all, commended them to God, and then departed from them with a heavy heart. He had not travelled far when he entered a wood, and there met with a hermit, who had long been retired from the world. Rinaldo greeted him, and the hermit replied courteously, and asked him who he was, and what was his purpose. Rinaldo replied, Sir, I have led a sinful life. Many deeds of violence have I done, and many men have I slain, not always in a good cause, but often under the impulse of my own headstrong passions. I have also been the cause of the death of many of my friends who took my part, not because they thought me in the right, but only for love of me. And now I come to make confession of all my sins, 
and to do penance for the rest of my life, if perhaps the mercy of God will forgive me. The hermit said, Friend, I perceive you have fallen into great sins, and have broken the commandments of God, but his mercy is greater than your sins, and if you repent from your heart and lead a new life, there is yet hope for you that he will forgive you what is past. So Rinaldo was comforted, and said, Master, I will stay with you, and what you bid, ain I will do. The hermit replied, Roots and vegetables will be your food, shirt or shoes you may not wear. Your lot must be poverty and want if you stay with me. Rinaldo replied, I will cheerfully bear all this and more. So he remained three whole years with the hermit, and after that his strength failed, and it seemed as if he was like to die. One night the hermit had a dream, and heard a voice from heaven, which commanded him to say to his companion that he must, without delay, go to the Holy Land and fight against the heathen. The hermit, when he heard that voice, was glad, and calling Rinaldo, he said, Friend, God's angel has commanded me to say to you that you must, without delay, go to Jerusalem, and help our fellow Christians in their struggle with the infidels. Then said Rinaldo, Ah, oh, master, how can I do that? It is over three years since I made a vow, no more to ride a horse, nor take a sword or spear in my hand. The hermit answered, Dear friend, obey God, and do what the angel commanded. I will do so, said Rinaldo, and pray for me, my master, that God may guide me right. Then he departed and went to the seaside, and took ship and came to Tripoli in Syria and as he went on his way his strength returned to him, till it was equal to what it was in his best days. And though he never mounted a horse, nor took a sword in his hand, yet with his pilgrim staff he did good service in the armies of the Christians, and it pleased God that he escaped unhurt, though he was present in many battles, and his courage inspired the men with the same. At last a truce was made with the Saracens, and Rinaldo, now old and infirm, wishing to see his native land again before he died, took ship and sailed for France. When he arrived, he shunned to go to the resorts of the great, and preferred to live among the humble folk where he was unknown. He did country work, and lived on milk and bread, drank water, and was therewith content. While he so lived, he heard that the city of Cologne was the holiest and best of cities, on account of the relics and bodies of saints who had there poured out their blood for the faith. This induced him to betake himself thither. When the pious hero arrived at Cologne, he went to the monastery of St. Peter and lived a holy life, occupied night and day in devotion. It so happened that at that time, in the next town to Cologne, there raged a dreadful pestilence. Many people came to Rinaldo to beg him to pray for them, that the plague might be stayed. The holy man prayed fervently, and besought the Lord to take away the plague from the people, and his prayer was heard. The stroke of the pestilence was arrested, and all the people thanked the holy man and praised God. Now there was at this time, at Cologne, a bishop, called Agilolphus, who was a wise and understanding man, who led a pure and secluded life, and set a good example to others. This bishop undertook to build the church of St. Peter, and gave notice to all stonemasons and other workmen round about to come to Cologne, where they should find work and wages. Among others came Rinaldo, and he worked among the labourers, and did more than four or five common workmen. When they went to dinner, he brought stone and mortar, so that they had enough for the whole day. When the others went to bed, he stretched himself out on the stones. He ate bread only, and drank nothing but water, and had for his wages but a penny a day. The head workman asked him his name, and where he belonged. He would not tell, but said nothing, and pursued his work. They called him St. Peter's workman, because he was so devoted to his work. When the overseer saw the diligence of this holy man, he chid the laziness of the other workmen, and said, you receive more pay than this good man, but do not do half as much work. For this reason, the other workmen hated Rinaldo, and made a secret agreement to kill him. 
They knew that he made it a practice to go every night to a certain church to pray and give alms, so they agreed to lay wait for him with the purpose to kill him. When he came to this spot they seized him and beat him over the head till he was dead. Then they put his body into a sack and stones with it and cast it into the Rhine, in the hope the sack would sink to the bottom and there be concealed. But God willed not that it should be so, but caused the sack to float on the surface and be thrown upon the bank. And the soul of the holy martyr was carried by angels with songs of praise up to the heavens. Now at that time the people of Dortmund had become converted to the Christian faith, and they sent to the Bishop of Cologne and desired him to give them some of the holy relics that are in such abundance in that city. So the bishop called together his clergy to deliberate what answer they should give to this request, and it was determined to give to the people of Dortmund the body of the holy man who had just suffered martyrdom. When now the body with the coffin was put on the cart, the cart began to move toward Dortmund without horses or help of men, and stopped not till it reached the place where the church of St. Rinaldo now stands. The bishop and his clergy followed the holy man to do him honour, with singing of hymns, for a space of three miles. And St. Rinaldo has ever since been the patron of that place, and many wonderful works has God done through him, as may be seen in the legends. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of Legends of Charlemagne. This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. Recording by Julie Burks. Legends of Charlemagne by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter Twenty One. Juan of Bordeaux. When Charlemagne grew old, he felt the burden of government become heavier year by year, till at last he called together his high barons and peers to propose to abdicate the empire and the throne of France in favor of his sons, Charlotte and Louis. The emperor was unreasonably partial to his eldest son. He would have been glad to have had the barons and peers demand Charlotte for their only sovereign, but that prince was so infamous for his falsehood and cruelty that the council strenuously opposed the emperor's proposal of abdicating, and implored him to continue to hold a scepter which he wielded with so much glory. Amaury of Hauteville, cousin of Ganleon, and now head of the wicked branch of the house of Manganza, was the secret partisan of Charlotte, whom he resembled in his loose morals and bad dispositions. Amaury nourished the most bitter resentment against the house of Guienne, of which the former duke, Sevenus, had often rebuked his misdeeds. He took advantage of this occasion to do injury to the two children whom the duke Sevenus had left under the charge of the duchess Charlotte, their mother, and at the same time to advance his interest with Charlotte by increasing his wealth and power. With this view, he suggested to the prince a new idea. He pretended to agree with the opinion of the barons, he said that it would be best to try Charlotte's capacity for government by giving him some rich provinces before placing him upon the throne, and that the emperor, without depriving himself of any part of his realm, might give Charlotte the investiture of Guienne. For although seven years had passed since the death of Sevenus, the young duke, his son, had not yet repaired to the court of Charlemagne to render the homage due to his lawful sovereign. We have often had occasion to admire the justice and wisdom of the advice which on all occasions the Duke Namo of Bavaria gave to Charlemagne, and he now discountenanced with indignation the selfish advice of Amory. He represented to the emperor the early age of the children of Sevenus and the useful and glorious services of their late father, and proposed to Charlemagne to send two knights to the Duchess at Bordeaux to summon her two sons to the court of the emperor to pay their respects and render homage. Charlemagne approved this advice and sent two chevaliers to demand the young princes of their mother. No sooner had the duchess learned the approach of the two knights than she sent distinguished persons to receive them, and as soon as they entered the palace she presented herself before them, 
with her elder and younger sons, Juan and Gerard. The deputies, delighted with the honors and caresses they received, accompanied with rich presents, left Bordeaux with regret, and on their return represented to Charlemagne that the young Duke Juan seemed born to tread in the footsteps of his brave father, informing him that in three months the young princes of Guen would present themselves at his court. The Duchess employed the short interval in giving her sons her last instructions. Juan received them in his heart, and Gerard gave as much heed to them as could be expected from one so young. The preparations for their departure having been made, the Duchess embraced them tenderly, commending them to the care of heaven, and charged them to call on their way, at the celebrated monastery of Cluny, to visit the abbot, the brother of their father. This abbot, worthy of his high dignity, had never lost an opportunity of doing good, setting an example of every excellence, and making virtue attractive by his example. He received his nephews with the greatest magnificence, and aware how useful his presence might be to them with Charlemagne, whose valued counsellor he was, he took with him the road to Paris. When Amory learned what reception the two deputies of Charlemagne had received at Bordeaux, and the arrangements made for the visit of the young princes to the emperor's court, he suggested to Charlotte to give him a troop of his guards, with which he proposed to lay wait for the young men in the wood of Montlaret, put them to death, and thereby give the prince Charlotte possession of the Duchy of Guienne. A plan of treachery and of violence agreed but too well with Charlotte's disposition. He not only adopted the suggestion of Amory, but insisted upon taking a part in it. They went out secretly by night, followed by a great number of attendants, all armed in black, to lie in ambuscade in the wood where the brothers were to pass. Gerard, the younger of the two, having amused himself as he rode by flying his hawk at such game as presented itself, had ridden in advance of his brother and the abbot of Cluny. Charlotte, who saw him coming, alone and unarmed, went forth to meet him, sought a quarrel with him, and threw him from his horse with a stroke of his lance. Gerard uttered a cry as he fell. Juan heard it and flew to his defense, with no other weapon than his sword. He came up with him and saw the blood flowing from his wound. "'What has this child done to you, wretch?' he exclaimed to Charlotte. "'How cowardly to attack him when unprepared to defend himself!' "'By my faith,' said Charlotte, "'I mean to do the same to you. "'Know that I am the son of Duke Terry of Ardan, "'from whom your father Sevenus took three castles. "'I have sworn to avenge him, and I defy you.' "'Coward,' answered Juan, "'I know well the baseness that dwells in your race. "'Worthy son of Terry, use the advantage that your armor gives you, "'but know that I fear you not.' At these words, Charlotte had the wickedness to put his lance in rest and to run upon Juan, who had barely time to wrap his arm in his mantle. With this feeble buckler, he received the thrust of the lance. It penetrated the mantle, but missed his body. Then, rising upon his stirrups, Sir Juan struck Charlotte so terrible a blow with his sword that the helmet was cleft asunder and his head too. The dastardly prince fell dead upon the ground. Juan now perceived that the wood was full of armed men. He called the men of his suite, and they hastily put themselves in order, but nobody issued from the wood to attack him. Almery, who saw Charlotte's fall, had no desire to compromit himself, and feeling sure that Charlemagne would avenge the death of his son, he saw no occasion for his doing anything more at present. He left Juan and the abbot of Cluny to bind up the wound of Gerard, and having seen them depart and resume their way to Paris, he took up the body of Charlotte, and, placing it across a horse, had it carried to Paris, where he arrived four hours after Juan. The abbot of Cluny presented his nephew to Charlemagne, but Juan refrained from paying his obeisance, complaining grievously of the ambush which had been set for him which he said could not have been without the emperor's permission. Charlemagne, 
surprised at a charge which his magnanimous soul was incapable of meriting, asked eagerly of the abbot what were the grounds of the complaints of his nephew. The abbot told him faithfully all that had happened, informing him that a cowardly knight, who called himself the son of Thierry of Ardenne, had wounded Gerard and run upon Juan, who was unarmed, but by his force and valor he had overcome the traitor and left him dead upon the plain. Charlemagne indignantly disavowed any connection with the action of the infamous Thierry, congratulating the young duke upon his victory, himself conducted the two brothers to a rich apartment, stayed to see the first dressing applied to the wound of Gerard, and left the brothers in charge of Duke Nemo of Bavaria, who, having been a companion in arms of the Duke Sevenus, regarded the young men almost as if they were his own sons. Charlemagne had hardly quitted them when, returning to his chamber, he heard cries and saw through the window a party of armed men just arrived. He recognized Almery, who bore a dead knight stretched across a horse, and the name of Charlotte was heard among the exclamations of the people assembled in the courtyard. Charles's partiality for this unworthy son was one of his weaknesses. He descended in trepidation to the courtyard, ran to Almery, and uttered a cry of grief on recognizing Charlotte. "'It is Juan of Bordeaux,' said the traitor Almery, "'who has massacred your son before it was in my power to defend him.' Charlemagne, furious at these words, seized a sword and flew to the apartment of the two brothers to plunge it into the heart of the murderer of his son. Duke Namo stopped his hand for an instant, while Charles told him the crime of which Huan was accused. "'He is a peer of the realm,' said Namo, "'and if he is guilty, is he not here in your power, and are we not peers the proper judges that condemn him to death?' Let not your hand be stained with his blood. The emperor, calmed by the wisdom of Duke Nemo, summoned Almery to his presence. The peers assembled to hear his testimony, and the traitor accused Juan of Bordeaux of having struck the fatal blow without allowing Charlotte an opportunity to defend himself, and though he knew that his opponent was the emperor's eldest son. The abbot of Cluny, indignant at the false accusation of Almery, advanced and said, By St. Benedict, sire, the traitor lies in his throat. If my nephew has slain Charlotte, it was in his own defense, and after having seen his brother wounded by him, and also in ignorance that his adversary was the prince. Though I am a son of the church, added the good abbot, I forget not that I am a knight by birth. I offer to prove with my body the lie upon Almery, if he dares sustain it, and I shall feel that I am doing a better work to punish a disloyal traitor than to sing lauds and matins. Who won to this time had kept silent, amazed at the black calumny of Almery, but now he stepped forth and addressing Almery said, Traitor, darest thou maintain in arms the lie thou hast uttered? Almery, a knight of great prowess, despising the youth and slight figure of Juan, hesitated not to offer his glove, which Juan seized. Then, turning again to the peers, he said, I pray you let the combat be allowed me, for never was there a more legitimate cause. The Duke Namo and the rest, deciding that the question should be remitted to the judgment of heaven, the combat was ordained, to which Charlemagne unwillingly consented. The young duke was restored to the charge of Duke Nemo, whom the next morning invested him with the honors of knighthood and gave him armor of proof with a white shield. The abbot of Cluny, delighted to find in his nephew sentiments worthy of his birth, embraced him, gave him his blessing, and hastened to the church of Saint-Germain to pray for him, while the officers of the king prepared the lists for the combat. The battle was long and obstinate. The address and agility of Juan enabled him to avoid the terrible blows which the ferocious Almery aimed at him, but Juan had more than once drawn blood from his antagonist. The effect began to be perceived in the failing strength of the traitor. At last he threw himself from his horse and, kneeling, begged for mercy. Spare me, he said, and I will confess all. Aid me to rise and lead me to Charlemagne. 
the brave and loyal Huan, at these words, put his sword under his left arm, and stretched out his right to raise the prostrate man, who seized the opportunity to give him a thrust in the side. The hauberk of Huan resisted the blow, and he was wounded but slightly. Transported with rage at this act of baseness, he forgot how necessary for his complete acquittal the confession of Almery was, and without delay dealt him the fatal blow. Duke Namo and the other peers approached, had the body of Almery dragged forth from the lists, and conducted Huan to Charlemagne. The emperor, however, listening to nothing but his resentment and grief for the death of his son, refused to be satisfied, and under the plea that Huan had not succeeded in making his accuser retract his charge, seemed resolved to confiscate his estates, and to banish him forever from France. It was not until after long entreaties on the part of Duke Nomo and the rest that he consented to grant Huan his pardon, under conditions which he should impose. Huan approached and knelt before the emperor, rendered his homage, and cried him mercy for the involuntary killing of his son. Charlemagne would not receive the hands of Huan in his own, but touched him with his scepter, saying, I receive thy homage, and pardon thee the death of my son, but only on one condition. You shall go immediately to the court of the Sultan Gadassio. You shall present yourself before him as he sits at meat, you shall cut off the head of the most illustrious guest whom you shall find sitting nearest to him. You shall kiss three times on the mouth the fair princess's daughter, and you shall demand of the sultan, as token of tribute to me, a handful of the white hair of his beard and four grinders from his mouth. These conditions caused a murmur from the assembly. What? said the abbot of Cluny. Slaughter a Saracen prince, without first offering him baptism. The second condition is not so hard, said the young peers, but the demand that Huan is bound to make of the old sultan is very uncivil, and it will be hard to obtain. The emperor's obstinacy, when he had once resolved upon a thing, is well known. To the courage of Huan nothing seemed impossible. I accept the conditions, said he, silencing the intercessions of the old duke of Bavaria, my liege, I accept my pardon at this price. I go to execute your commands as your vassal and a peer of France. With the Duke Nemo and Abbot of Cluny, being unable to obtain any relaxation of the sentence passed by Charlemagne, led forth the young Duke, who determined to set out at once on his expedition. All that the good Abbot could obtain of him was that he should prepare for this perilous undertaking by going first to Rome, to pay his homage to the Pope, who was the brother of the Duchess Alice, Juan's mother, and from him demand absolution and his blessing. Juan promised it, and forthwith set out on his way to Rome. End of chapter 21. Recording by Julie Burks. Chapter 22 of Legends of Charlemagne. This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. Recording by Julie Burks. Legends of Charlemagne by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 22. Huan of Bordeaux continued. Huan, having traversed the Apennines in Italy, arrived at the environs of Rome, where, laying aside his armor, he assumed the dress of a pilgrim. In this attire he presented himself before the Pope, and not till after he had made a full confession of his sins did he announce himself as his nephew. "'Ah, my dear nephew!' exclaimed the Holy Father. "'What harder penance could I impose than the Emperor has already done? Go in peace, my son,' he added, absolving him. I go to intercede for you with the Most High. Then he led his nephew into his palace and introduced him to all the cardinals and princes of Rome as the Duke of Guyenne, son of the Duchess Alice, his sister. Huan, at setting out, had made a vow not to stop more than three days in a place. The Holy Father took advantage of this time to inspire him with zeal for the glory of Christianity 
and with confidence in the protection of the Most High. He advised him to embark for Palestine, to visit the Holy Sepulchre, and to depart thence for the interior of Asia. Loaded with the blessings of the Holy Father, Huan, obeying his counsels, embarked for Palestine, arrived, and visited with the greatest reverence the holy places. He then departed and took his way toward the east. But ignorant of the country and of the language, he lost himself in a forest and remained three days without seeing a human creature, living on honey and wild fruits, which he found on the trees. The third day, seeking a passage through a rocky defile, he beheld a man in tattered clothing, whose beard and hair covered his breast and shoulders. This man stopped on seeing him, observed him, and recognized the arms and bearing of a French knight. He immediately approached and exclaimed, in the language of the south of France, God be praised! Do I indeed behold a chevalier of my own country, after fifteen years passed in this desert, without seeing the face of a fellow countryman? Juan, to gratify him still more, unlaced his helmet, and came towards him with a smiling countenance. The other regarded him with more surprise than at first. "'Good heaven!' he exclaimed. "'Was there ever such a resemblance?' "'Ah, noble sir,' he added, "'tell me, I beseech you, of what country and race you come?' "'I require,' replied Juan, "'before telling you mine, that you first reveal your own.' Let it suffice you at present to know that I am a Christian, and that in Guyane I was born. Ah, oh, heaven, grant that my eyes and my heart do not deceive me, exclaimed the unknown. My name is Sherisman. I am brother to Geyer, the mayor of Bordeaux. I was taken prisoner in the battle when my dear and illustrious master, Sevenus, lost his life. For three years I endured the miseries of slavery. At length I broke my chains and escaped to this desert, where I have sustained myself in solitude ever since. Your features recall to me my beloved sovereign, in whose service I was from my infancy till his death. Juan made no reply, but by embracing the old man with tears in his eyes. Then Sherisman learned that his arms enfolded the son of the Duke Sevenus. He led him to his cabin and spread before him the dry fruits and honey, which formed his only ailment. Huan recounted his adventures to Sherisman, who was moved to tears at the recital. He then consulted him on means of conducting his enterprise. Sherisman hesitated not to confess that success seemed impossible. Nevertheless, he swore a solemn oath never to abandon him. The Saracen language, which he was a master of, would be serviceable to them when they should leave the desert and mingle with men. They took the route of the Red Sea and entered Arabia. Their way lay through a region which Sherisman described as full of terrors. It was inhabited by Oberon, king of the fairies, who made captive such knights as were rash enough to penetrate into it and transform them into hobgoblins. It was possible to avoid this district at the expense of somewhat lengthening their route, but no dangers could deter Juan of Bordeaux and the brave Sherisman, who had now resumed the armor of a knight, reluctantly consented to share with him the dangers of the shorter route. They entered a wood and arrived at a spot whence alleys branched off in various directions. One of them seemed to be terminated by a superb palace, whose gilded roofs were adorned with brilliant weathercocks covered with diamonds. A superb chariot issued from the gate of the palace and drove toward Huan and his companion, as if to meet them halfway. The prince saw no one in the chariot, but a child, apparently about five years old, very beautiful, and clad in a robe which glittered with precious stones. At the sight of him, Sherisman's terror was extreme, he seized the reins of Juan's horse and turned him about, hurrying the prince away and assuring him that they were lost if they stopped to parley with the mischievous dwarf, who, though he appeared a child, was full of years and of treachery. Juan was sorry to lose sight of the beautiful dwarf, whose aspect had nothing in it to alarm. 
yet he followed his friend, who urged on his horse with all possible speed. Presently a storm began to roar through the forest, the daylight grew dim, and they found their way with difficulty. From time to time they seemed to hear an infantine voice which said, "'Stop, Duke Juan! Listen to me! It is in vain you fly me!' Sherisman only fled the faster, and stopped not until he had reached the gate of a monastery of monks and nuns, the two communities of which were assembled at that time in a religious procession. Sherisman, feeling safe from the malice of the dwarf in the presence of so many holy persons and the sacred banners, stopped to ask an asylum, and made Juan dismount also. But at that moment they were joined by the dwarf, who blew a blast upon an ivory horn which hung from his neck. Immediately the good Sherisman, in spite of himself, began to dance like a young collegian, and seizing the hand of an aged nun, who felt as if it would be her death, they footed it briskly over the grass, and were imitated by all the other monks and nuns mingled together, forming the strangest dancing party ever beheld. Juan alone felt no disposition to dance, but he came near dying of laughter at seeing the ridiculous postures and leaps of the others. The dwarf, approaching Juan, said in a sweet voice, and in Juan's own language, Duke of Guyenne, why do you shun me? I conjure you, in heaven's name, speak to me. Juan, hearing himself addressed in this serious manner, and knowing that no evil spirit would dare to use the holy name in aid of his schemes, replied, Sir, whoever you are, I am ready to hear and answer you. Juan, my friend, continued the dwarf, I always loved your race, and you have been dear to me ever since your birth. The gracious state of conscience in which you were when you entered my wood has protected you from all enchantments, even if I had intended to practice any upon you. If these monks, these nuns, and even your friend Sherisman had had a conscience as pure as yours, my horn would not have set them dancing. But where is the monk or the nun who can always be deaf to the voice of the tempter, and Sherisman in the desert has often doubted the power of providence? At these words, Huan saw the dancers overcome with exertion. He begged mercy for them, the dwarf granted it, and the effect of the horn ceased at once. The nuns got rid of their partners, smoothed their dresses, and hastened to resume their places in the procession. Sherisman, overcome with heat, panting, and unable to stand on his legs, threw himself upon the ground and began, "'Did I not tell you?' He was going on in an angry tone. But the dwarf, approaching, said, "'Sherisman, why have you murmured against Providence? Why have you thought evil of me? You deserve this light punishment, but I know you to be good and loyal. I mean to show myself your friend, as you shall soon see.' At these words he presented him a rich goblet. "'Make the sign of the cross on this cup,' said he, "'and then believe that I hold my power from the God you adore, "'whose faithful servant I am, as well as you.' Sherisman obeyed, and on the instant the cup was filled with delicious wine, a draught of which restored vigor to his limbs and made him feel young again. Overcome with gratitude, he threw himself on his knees, but the dwarf raised him, and bade him sit beside him, and thus commenced his history. Julius Caesar, going by sea to join his army, was driven by a storm to take shelter in the island of Celia, where dwelt the fairy Glorianda. From this renowned pair I draw my birth. I am the inheritor of that which was most admirable in each of my parents, my father's heroic qualities and my mother's beauty and magic art, but a malicious sister of my mother's, in revenge for some slight offense, touched me with her wand when I was only five years old, and forbade me to grow any bigger, and my mother, with all her power, was unable to annul the sentence. I have thus continued infantile in appearance, though full of years and experience. The power which I derive from my mother I use sometimes for my own diversion, but always to promote justice and to reward virtue. I am able and willing to assist you, Duke of Guyenne. 
for I know the errand on which you come hither. I presage for you, if you follow my counsels, complete success, and the beautiful Claramunda for a wife. When he had thus spoken, he presented to Juan the precious and useful cup, which had the faculty of filling itself when a good man took it in his hand. He gave him also his beautiful horn of ivory, saying to him, Juan, when you sound this gently, you will make the hearers dance as you have seen. But if you sound it forcibly, fear not that I shall hear it, though at a hundred leagues distance, and will fly to your relief. But be careful not to sound it in that way, unless upon the most urgent occasion. Oberon directed Juan what course he should take to reach the country of the Sultan Gadasio. You will encounter great perils, said he, before arriving there, and I fear me, he added with tears in his eyes, that you will not in everything obey my direction, and in that case you will suffer much calamity. Then he embraced Huan and Sherisman and left them. Huan and his follower traveled many days through the desert before they reached any inhabited place, and all this while the wonderful cup sustained them, furnishing them not only wine but food also. At last they came to a great city. As day was declining, they entered its suburbs, and Sherisman, who spoke the Saracen language perfectly, inquired for an inn where they could pass the night. A person who appeared to be one of the principal inhabitants, seeing two strangers of respectable appearance making this inquiry, stepped forward and begged them to accept the shelter of his mansion. They entered, and their host did the honors of his abode with a politeness which they were astonished to see in a Saracen. He had them served with coffee and sherbet, and all was conducted with great decorum, till one of the servants awkwardly overturned a cup of hot coffee on the host's legs, when he started up, exclaiming in very good Cascon, "'Blood and thunder, you blockhead! You deserve to be thrown over the mosque!' Huan could not help laughing to see the vivacity and the language of his country thus break out unawares. The host, who had no idea that his guests understood his words, was astonished when Huan addressed him in the dialect of his country. Immediately confidence was established between them, especially when the domestics had retired. The host, seeing that he was discovered, and that the two pretended Saracens were from the borders of the Garan, embraced them and disclosed that he was a Christian. Huan, who had learned prudence from the advice of Oberon to test his host's sincerity, drew from his robe the cup which the fairy king had given him, and presented it empty to the host. A fair cup, said he, but I should like it better if it was full. Immediately it was so. The host, astonished, dared not put it to his lips. Drink boldly, my dear fellow countrymen, said Huan. Your truth is proved by this cup, which only fills itself in the hands of an honest man. The host did not hesitate longer. The cup passed freely from hand to hand. Their mutual cordiality increased as it passed, and each recounted his adventures. Those of Huan redoubled his host's respect, for he recognized in him his legitimate sovereign, while the host's narrative was in these words. My name is Floriac. This great and strong city, you will hear with surprise and grief, is governed by a brother of Duke Sevenus and your uncle. You have no doubt heard that a young brother of the Duke of Guyenne was stolen away from the seashore with his companions by some corsairs. I was then his page, and we were carried by those corsairs to Barbary, where we were sold for slaves. The Barbary prince sent us as part of the tribute which he yearly paid to his sovereign, the Sultan Gadasio. Your uncle, who had been somewhat puffed up by the flattery of his attendants, thought to increase his importance with his new master by telling him his rank. The Sultan, who, like a true Mussulman, detested all Christian princes, exerted himself from that moment to bring him over to the Saracen faith. He succeeded but too well. Your uncle, seduced by the arts of the Santons, and by the pleasures and indulgences which the Sultan allowed him, 
committed the horrid crime of apostasy. He renounced his baptism and embraced Mahometanism. Galdacio then loaded him with honors, made him espouse one of his nieces, and sent him to reign over this city and adjoining country. Your uncle preserved for me the same friendship which he had had when a boy, but all his caresses and efforts could not make me renounce my faith. Perhaps he respected me in his heart for my resistance to his persuasions. Perhaps he had hopes of inducing me in time to imitate him. He made me accompany him to the city of which he was master. He gave me his confidence and permits me to keep in my service some Christians whom I protect for the sake of their faith. Ah, exclaimed Juan, take me to this guilty uncle, a prince of the house of Gouen. Must he not blush at the cowardly abandonment of the faith of his fathers? Alas, replied Floriac, I fear he will neither be sensible of shame at your reproaches, nor of pleasure at the sight of a nephew so worthy of his lineage. Brutified by sensuality, jealous of his power, which he often exercises with cruelty, he will more probably restrain you by force or put you to death. Be it so, said the brave and fervent Juan, I could not die in a better cause, and I demand of you to conduct me to him to-morrow, after having told him of my arrival and my birth. Floriac still objected, but Juan would take no denial, and he promised obedience. Next morning Floriac waited upon the governor and told him of the arrival of his nephew, Juan of Bordeaux, and of the intention of the prince to present himself at his court that very day. The governor, surprised, did not immediately answer, though he at once made up his mind what to do. He knew that Floriac loved Christians and the princes of his native land too well to aid in any treason to one of them. He therefore feigned great pleasure at hearing of the arrival of the eldest-born of his family at his court. He immediately sent Floriac to find him. He caused his palace to be put in festal array, his divan to be assembled, and after giving some secret orders, went himself to meet his nephew, whom he introduced under his proper name and title to all the great officers of his court. Juan burned with indignation at seeing his uncle with forehead encircled with a rich turban, surmounted with a crescent of precious stones. His natural candor made him receive with pain the embraces which the treacherous governor lavished upon him. Meanwhile, the hope of finding a suitable moment to reproach him for his apostasy made him submit to those honors which his uncle caused to be rendered to him. The governor evaded with address the chance of being alone with Juan, and spent all the morning in taking him through his gardens and palace. At last, when the hour of dinner approached, and the governor took him by the hand to lead him into the dining hall, Juan seized the opportunity and said to him in a low voice, O oh, my uncle, O oh, prince, brother of the Duke Sevenus, in what condition have I the grief and shame of seeing you? The governor pretended to be moved, pressed his hand, and whispered in his ear, Silence, my dear nephew. Tomorrow morning I will hear you fully. Juan, comforted a little by these words, took his seat at the table by the side of the governor. The mufti, some Cadiz, agas, and santons filled the other places. Shersuman sat down with them, but Floriac, who would not lose sight of his guests, remained standing, and passed in and out to observe what was going on within the palace. He soon perceived a number of armed men gliding through the passages and antechambers connected with the dining hall. He was about to enter to give his guests notice of what he had seen, when he heard a violent noise and commotion in the hall. The cause was this. Juan and Sherisman were well enough suited with the first course, and ate with good appetite, but the people of their country not being accustomed to drink only water at their meals, Juan and Sherisman looked at one another, not very well pleased at such a regimen. Juan laughed outright at the impatience of Sherisman, but soon, experiencing the same want himself, he drew forth Oberon's cup 
and made the sign of the cross. The cup filled, and he drank it off, and handed it to Sherisman, who followed his example. The governor and his officers, seeing this abhorred sign, contracted their brows and sat in silent consternation. Juan pretended not to observe it, and having filled the cup again, handed it to his uncle, saying, "'Pray, join us, dear uncle. It is excellent Bordeaux wine, the drink that will be to you like mother's milk.' The governor, who often drank in secret with his own favorite sultanas, the wines of Greece and Shiraz, never in public drank anything but water. He had not for a long time tasted the excellent wines of his native land. He was sorely tempted to drink what was now handed to him. It looked so bright in the cup, outshining the gold itself. He stretched forth his hand, took the brimming goblet, and raised it to his lips, when immediately it dried up and disappeared. Huan and Sherisman, like Gascons as they were, laughed at his astonishment. "'Christian dogs!' he exclaimed. "'Do you dare to insult me at my own table? But I will soon be revenged!' At these words he threw the cup at the head of his nephew, who caught it with his left hand, while with the other he snatched the turban with its crescent from the governor's head and threw it on the floor. All the Saracens started up from table with loud outcries, and prepared to avenge the insult. Huan and Sherisman put themselves on their defense, and met with their swords the scimitars directed against them. At this moment the doors of the hall opened, and a crowd of soldiers and armed eunuchs rushed in, who joined in the attack upon Huan and Sherisman. The prince and his followers took refuge on a broad shelf or sideboard, where they kept at bay the crowd of assailants, making the most forward of them smart for their audacity. But more troops came pressing in, and the brave Huan, inspired by the wine of Bordeaux, and not angry enough to lose his relish for a joke, blew a gentle note upon his horn, and no sooner was it heard than it quelled the rage of the combatants and set them to dancing. Huan and Sherisman, no longer attacked, looked down from their elevated position on a scene the most singular and amusing. Very soon the sultanas, hearing the sound of the dance and finding their guards withdrawn, came into the hall and mixed with the dancers. The favorite sultana seized upon a young santan, who performed jumps two feet high, but soon the long dresses of this couple got intermingled and threw them down. The Santon's beard was caught in the Sultana's necklace, and they could not disentangle them. The governor by no means approved this familiarity, and took two steps forward to get at the Santon, but he stumbled over a prostrate dervish and measured his length on the floor. The dancing continued till the strength of the performers was exhausted, and they fell, one after the other, and lay helpless. The governor at length made signs to Huan that he would yield everything, if he would but allow him to rest. The bargain was ratified. The governor allowed Huan and Sherisman to depart on their way, and even gave them a ring which would procure them safe passage through his country and access to the Sultan Galdasio. The two friends hastened to avail themselves of this favorable turn, and taking leave of Floriac, pursued their journey. End of chapter 22. Recording by Julie Burks. Chapter 23 of Legends of Charlemagne. This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. Recording by Julie Burks. Legends of Charlemagne by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 23. Juan of Bordeaux Continued. Juan had seen many beauties at his mother's court, but his heart had never been touched with love. Honor had been his mistress, and in pursuit of that he had never found time to give a thought to softer cares. Strange that a heart so insensible should first be touched by something so unsubstantial as a dream, but so it was. The day after the adventure with his uncle, Night overtook the travelers as they passed through a forest. A grotto offered them shelter from the night dews. 
the magic cup supplied their evening meal, for such was its virtue that it afforded not only wine, but more solid fare when desired. Fatigue soon threw them into profound repose. Lulled by the murmur of the foliage and breathing the fragrance of the flowers, Huan dreamed that a lady more beautiful than he had ever before seen hung over him and imprinted a kiss upon his lips. As he stretched out his arms to embrace her, a sudden gust of wind swept her away. Huan awoke in an agony of regret. A few moments sufficed to afford some consolation in showing him that what had passed was but a dream, but his perplexity and sadness could not escape the notice of Sherisman. Huan hesitated not to inform his faithful follower of the reason of his pensiveness, and got nothing in return but his rallyings for allowing himself to be disturbed by such a cause. He recommended a draft from the fairy goblet, and Huan tried it with good effect. At early dawn they resumed their way. They traveled till high noon, but said little to one another. Huan was musing on his dream, and Sherisman's thoughts flew back to his early days on the banks of the flowery Garonne. On a sudden they were startled by the cry of distress, and turning an angle of the wood, came where a knight hard-pressed was fighting with a furious lion. The knight's horse lay dead, and it seemed as if another moment would end the combat, for terror and fatigue had quite disabled the knight for further resistance. He fell, and the lion's paw was raised over him, when a blow from Huan's sword turned the monster's rage upon a new enemy. His roar shook the forest, and he crouched in act to spring when, with the rapidity of lightning, Huan plunged his sword into his side. He rolled over on the plain in the agonies of death. They raised the knight from the ground, and Sherisman hastened to offer him a draught from the fairy cap. The wine sparkled to the brim, and the warrior put forth his lips to quaff it, but it shrunk away and did not even wet his lips. He dashed the goblet angrily on the ground with an exclamation of resentment. This incident did not tend to make either party more acceptable to the other, and what followed was worse. For when Huan said, Sir Knight, thank God for your deliverance, thank Mohammed rather yourself, said he, for he has led you this day to render service to no less a personage than the Prince of Hyrcania. At the sound of this blasphemy, Huan drew his sword and turned upon the miscreant who, little disposed to encounter the prowess of which he had so lately seen proof, betook himself to flight. He ran to Huan's horse and, lightly vaulting on his back, clapped spurs to his side and galloped out of sight. The adventure was vexatious, yet there was no remedy. The prince and sherisman continued their journey with the aid of the remaining horse as they best might. At length, as evening set in, they described the pinnacles and towers of a great city full before them, which they knew to be the famous city of Baghdad. They were well nigh exhausted with fatigue when they arrived at its precincts, and in the darkness, not knowing what course to take, were glad to meet an aged woman who, in reply to their inquiries, offered them such accommodations as her cottage could supply. They thankfully accepted the offer and entered the low door. The good dame busily prepared the best fare her stores supplied, milk, figs, and peaches, deeply regretting that the bleak winds had nipped her almond trees. Sir Hwan thought he had never in his life tasted any fare so good. The old lady talked while her guests ate. She doubted not, she said, that they had come to be present at the great feast in honor of the marriage of the sultan's daughter, which was to take place on the morrow. They asked who the bridegroom was to be, and the old lady answered, the prince of Hyrcania, but added, our princess hates him, and would rather wed a dragon than him. How do you know that? asked Huan, and the dame informed him that she had it from the princess herself, who was her foster child. Huan inquired the reason of the princess's aversion, and the woman, pleased to find her chat excite so much interest, replied that it was all in consequence of a dream. A dream? exclaimed Huan. Yes, a dream. She dreamed that she was a hind, and that the prince as a hunter was pursuing her, and had almost overtaken her, when a beautiful dwarf appeared in view, drawn in a golden car, 
having by his side a young man of yellow hair and fair complexion, like one from a foreign land. She dreamed that the car stopped where she stood, and that, having resumed her own form, she was about to ascend it, when suddenly it faded from her view, and with it the dwarf and the fair-haired youth. But from her heart that vision did not fade, and from that time her affianced bridegroom, the Hercynian prince, had become odious to her sight. Yet the sultan, her father, by no means regarding such a cause as sufficient to prevent the marriage, had named the morrow as the time when it should be solemnized, in presence of his court and many princes of the neighboring countries, whom the fame of the princess's beauty and the bridegroom's splendor had brought to the scene. We may suppose this conversation woke a tumult of thoughts in the breast of Huan. Was it not clear that Providence led him on, and cleared the way for his happy success? Sleep did not early visit the eyes of Huan that night, but with the sanguine temper of youth he indulged his fancy in imagining the sequel of his strange experience. The next day, which he could not but regard as the decisive day of his fate, he prepared to deliver the message of Charlemagne. Clad in his armor, fortified with his ivory horn and his ring, he reached the palace of Gaudacio, when the guests were assembled at the banquet. As he approached the gate, a voice called on all true believers to enter, and Huan, the brave and faithful Huan, in his impatience passed in under that false pretension. He had no sooner passed the barrier than he felt ashamed of his baseness, and was overwhelmed with regret. To make amends for his fault, he ran forward to the second gate and cried to the porter, "'Dog of a misbeliever! I command you, in the name of him who died on the cross, open to me!' The points of a hundred weapons immediately opposed his passage. Juan then remembered for the first time the ring he had received from his uncle, the governor. He produced it and demanded to be led to the sultan's presence. The officer of the guard recognized the ring, made a respectful obeisance, and allowed him free entrance. In the same way, he passed the other doors to the rich saloon, where the great sultan was at dinner with his tributary princes. At sight of the ring, the chief attendant led Huan to the head of the hall and introduced him to the sultan and his princes as the ambassador of Charlemagne. A seat was provided for him near the royal party. The prince of Hyrcania, the same whom Huan had rescued from the lion, and who was the destined bridegroom of the beautiful Claramunda, sat on the sultan's right hand, and the princess herself on his left. It chanced that Huan found himself near the seat of the princess, and hardly were the ceremonies of reception over before he made haste to fulfill the commands of Charlemagne by imprinting a kiss upon her rosy lips, and after that a second, not by command, but by good will. The prince of Hyrcania cried out, Audacious infidel, take the reward of thy insolence, and aimed a blow at Huan, which, if it had reached him, would have brought his embassy to a speedy termination. But the ingrate failed of his aim, and Huan punished his blasphemy and ingratitude at once by a blow which severed his head from his body. So suddenly had all this happened that no hand had been raised to arrest it, but now Gadasio cried out, Seize the murderer! Huan was hemmed in on all sides, but his redoubtable sword kept the crowd of courtiers at bay, but he saw new combatants enter and could not hope to maintain his ground against so many. He recollected his horn, and, raising it to his lips, blew a blast almost as loud as that of Roland at Roncesvalles. It was in vain. Oberon heard it, but the sin of which Huan had been guilty in bearing, though but for a moment, the character of a believer in the false prophet, had put it out of Oberon's power to help him. Huan, finding himself deserted and conscious of the cause, lost his strength and energy, was seized, loaded with chains, and plunged into a dungeon. His life was spared for the time, merely that he might be reserved for a more painful death. The sultan meant that, after being made to feel all the torments of hunger and despair, he should be flayed alive. But an enchanter more ancient and more powerful than Oberon himself interested himself for the brave Huan. The enchanter was love. 
the Princess Claramunda learned with horror the fate to which the young prince was destined. By the aid of her government, she gained over the keeper of the prison and went herself to lighten the chains of her beloved. It was her hand that removed his fetters. From her he received supplies of food to sustain a life which he devoted from thenceforth wholly to her. After the most tender explanations, the princess departed, promising to repeat her visit on the morrow. The next day she came according to promise and again brought supplies of food. These visits were continued during a whole month. Juan was too good a son of the church to forget that the amiable princess was a Saracen, and he availed himself of these interviews to instruct her in the true faith. How easy it is to believe the truth when uttered by the lips of those we love. Claramunda ere long professed her entire belief in the Christian doctrines and desired to be baptized. Meanwhile, the sultan had repeatedly inquired of the jailer how his prisoner bore the pains of famine and learned to his surprise that he was not yet much reduced thereby. On his repeating the inquiry after a short interval, the keeper replied that the prisoner had died suddenly and had been buried in the cavern. The sultan could only regret that he had not sooner ordered the execution of the sentence. While these things were going on, the faithful sheriffsman, who had not accompanied Juan in his last adventure, but had learned by common rumor the result of it, came to the court in hopes of doing something for the rescue of his master. He presented himself to the sultan as Solario, his nephew. Aldacia received him with kindness, and all the courtiers loaded him with attentions. He soon found means to inform himself how the princess regarded the brave but unfortunate Juan, and having made himself known to her, confidence was soon established between them. Claramunda readily consented to assist in the escape of Juan and to quit with him her father's court to repair to that of Charlemagne. Their united efforts had nearly perfected their arrangement, a vessel was secretly prepared, and all things in forwardness for the flight, when an unlooked-for obstacle presented itself. Juan himself positively refused to go, leaving the orders of Charlemagne unexecuted. Sherisman was in despair. Bitterly he complained of the fickleness and cruelty of Oberon in withdrawing his aid at the very crisis when it was most necessary. Earnestly he urged every argument to satisfy the prince that he had done enough for honor and could not be held bound to achieve impossibilities. But all was of no avail, and he knew not which way to turn, when one of those events occurred which are so frequent under Turkish despotisms. A courier arrived at the court of the sultan, bearing the ring of his sovereign, the mighty Agripard, Caliph of Arabia, and bringing the bowstring for the neck of Galdacio. No reason was assigned, none but the pleasure of the caliph is ever required in such cases, but it was suspected that the bearer of the bowstring had persuaded the caliph that Galdacio, whose rapacity was well known, had accumulated immense treasures which he had not duly shared with his sovereign, and thus had obtained an order to supersede him in his emirship. The body of Galdacio would have been cast out a prey to dogs and vultures had not Sherisman, under the character of nephew of the deceased, been permitted to receive it and give it decent burial, which he did, but not till he had taken possession of the beard and grinders agreeably to the orders of Charlemagne. No obstacle now stood in the way of the lovers and their faithful follower in returning to France. They sailed, taking Rome in their way, where the Holy Father himself blessed the union of his nephew, Duke Juan of Bordeaux, with the Princess Claramunda. Soon afterward they arrived in France, where Juan laid his trophies at the feet of Charlemagne, and being restored to the favor of the Emperor, hastened to present himself and his bride to the Duchess, his mother, and to the faithful liegemen of his province of Guyenne and his city of Bordeaux, where the pair were received with transports of joy. End of chapter 23. Recording by Julie Burks. Chapter 24 of Legends of Charlemagne. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Morris. Legends of Charlemagne by Thomas Bullfinch. Auger the Dane. Auger the Dane was the son of Geoffrey, who wrested Denmark from the pagans and reigned the first Christian king of that country. When Auger was born, before he was baptized, six ladies of ravishing beauty appeared all at once in the chamber of the infant. They encircled him, and she who appeared the eldest took him in her arms, kissed him, and laid her hand upon his heart. "'I give you,' said she, "'to be the bravest warrior of your times.' She delivered the infant to her sister, who said, "'I give you the abundant opportunities to display your valour.' "'Sister!' said the third lady. You have given him a dangerous boon. I give him that he shall never be vanquished. The fourth sister added, as she laid her hands upon his eyes and his mouth, I give you the gift of pleasing. The fifth said, Lest all these gifts serve only to betray, I give you sensibility to return the love you inspire. Then spoke Morgana, the youngest and handsomest of the group, "'Charming creature, I claim you for my own, and I give you not to die, till you shall have come to pay me a visit in my Isle of Avalon.' Then she kissed the child and departed with her sisters. After this the king had the child carried to the font and baptized with the name of Auger. In his education nothing was neglected to elevate him to the standard of a perfect knight, and render him accomplished in all the arts necessary to make him a hero. He had hardly reached the age of sixteen years when Charlemagne, whose power was established over all the sovereigns of his time, recollected that Geoffrey, Ogier's father, had omitted to render the homage due to him as emperor and sovereign lord of Denmark, one of the grand fiefs of the empire. He accordingly sent an embassy to demand of the king of Denmark this homage, and on receiving a refusal, couched in haughty terms, sent an army to enforce the demand. Geoffrey, after an unsuccessful resistance, was forced to comply, and, as a pledge of his sincerity, delivered Auger, his eldest son, a hostage to Charles to be brought up at his court. He was placed in charge of the Duke Namon of Bavaria, the friend of his father, who treated him like his own son. Auger grew up more and more handsome and amiable every day. He surpassed in form, strength, and address all noble youths his companions. He failed not to be present at all tourneys. He was attentive to the elder knights, and burned with impatience to imitate them. Yet his heart rose sometimes, in secret, against his condition as a hostage, and as one apparently forgotten by his father. The king of Denmark, in fact, was at this time occupied with new loves. Auger's mother having died, he had married a second wife, and had a son named Guillaume. The new queen had absolute power over her husband, and fearing that, if he should see Auger again, he would give him the preference over Guillaume, she had adroitly persuaded him to delay rendering his homage to Charlemagne, till now four years had passed away since the last renewal of that ceremony. Charlemagne, irritated at this delinquency, drew closer the bonds of Augier's captivity, until he should receive a response from the King of Denmark to a fresh summons, which he caused to be sent to him. The answer of Geoffrey was insulting and defiant, and the rage of Charlemagne was roused to the highest degree. He was at first disposed to wreak his vengeance upon Auger, his hostage, but at the entreaties of Duke Namon, who felt towards his pupil like a father, consented to spare his life if Auger would swear fidelity to him as his liege lord, and promise not to quit the court without his permission. Auger accepted these terms, and was allowed to retain all the freedom he had before enjoyed. The emperor would have immediately taken arms to reduce his disobedient vassal if he had not been called off in another direction by a message from Pope Leo imploring his assistance. The Saracens had landed in the neighborhood of Rome, occupied Mount Janiculum, and prepared to pass the Tiber and carry fire and sword to the capital of the Christian world. Charlemagne hesitated not to yield to the entreaties of the Pope. He speedily assembled an army, crossed the Alps, traversed Italy, and arrived at Spoleto, a strong place to which the Pope had retired. Leo, at the head of his cardinals, advanced to meet him, and rendered him homage as to the son of Pepin, the illustrious protector of the Holy See, coming as his father had done, to defend it in the hour of need. Charlemagne stopped but two days at Spoleto, and learning that the infidels, having rendered themselves masters of Rome, were besieging the capital, which could not hold out long against them, 
marched promptly to attack them. The advanced posts of the army were commanded by Duke Namal, on whom Augier waited as his squire. He did not yet bear arms, not having received the order of knighthood. The Oriflame, the royal standard, was borne by a knight named Alori, who showed himself unworthy of the honour. Duke Namo, seeing a strong body of the infidels advancing to attack him, gave the word to charge them. Augier remained in the rear with the other youths, grieving much that he was not permitted to fight. Very soon he saw Alori lower the oriflame and turn his horse in flight. Augier pointed him out to the young men, and seizing a club, rushed upon Alori and struck him from his horse. Then, with his companions, he disarmed him, clothed himself in his armor, raised the oriflame, and mounting the horse of the unworthy knight, flew to the front rank where he joined Duke Namo, drove back the infidels, and carried the oriflame quite through their broken ranks. The duke, thinking it was Alori, whom he had not held in high esteem, was astonished at his strength and valor. Auger's young companions imitated him, supplying themselves with armor from the bodies of the slain. They followed Auger and carried death into the ranks of the Saracens, who fell back in confusion upon their main body. Duke Namal now ordered a retreat, and Auger obeyed with reluctance, when they perceived Charlemagne advancing to their assistance. The combat now became general, and was more terrible than ever. Charlemagne had overthrown Corsubal, the commander of the Saracens, and had drawn his famous sword Joyeuse to cut off his head, when two Saracen knights set upon him at once, one of whom slew his horse, and the other overthrew the emperor on the sand. Perceiving by the eagle on his cask who he was, they dismounted in haste to give him his death-blow. Never was the life of the emperor in such peril. But Augier, who saw him fall, flew to his rescue. Though embarrassed with the oriflame, he pushed his horse against one of the Saracens and knocked him down, and with his sword dealt the other so vigorous a blow that he fell stunned to the earth. Then helping the emperor to rise, he remounted him on the horse of one of the fallen knights. "'Brave and generous Alori!' Charles exclaimed. "'I owe you my honour and life!' Auger made no answer, but, leaving Charlemagne surrounded by a great many of the knights who had flown to his succour, he plunged into the thickest ranks of the enemy and carried the oriflame, followed by a gallant trail of youthful warriors, till the standard of Mahomet turned in retreat, and the infidels sought safety in their entrenchments. Then the good Archbishop Turpin laid aside his helmet and bloody sword, for he always felt that he was clearly in the line of his duty while slaying infidels, took his mitre and his crozier, and intoned Te Deum. At this moment Auger, covered with blood and dust, came to lay the oriflame at the feet of the emperor. He was followed by a train of warriors of short stature, who walked ill at ease, loaded with armor too heavy for them. Auger knelt at the feet of Charlemagne, who embraced him, calling him a lorry, while Turpin, from the height of the altar, blessed him with all his might. Then young Orlando, son of Count Milone, and nephew of Charlemagne, no longer able to endure this misapprehension, threw down his helmet and ran to unlace Auger's, while the other young men laid aside theirs. Our author says he cannot express the surprise, the admiration, and the tenderness of the emperor and his peers. Charles folded Auger in his arms, and the happy fathers of those brave youths embraced them with tears of joy. The good duke Namo stepped forward, and Charlemagne yielded Auger to his embrace. "'How much do I owe you?' he said, good and wise friend, for having restrained my anger. My dear Auger, I owe you my life. My sword leaps to touch your shoulder, yours and those of your brave young friends. At these words he drew the famous sword Joyeuse, and while Auger and the rest knelt before him, gave them the accolade, conferring on them the order of knighthood. The young Orlando and his cousin Oliver could not refrain, even in the presence of the emperor, from falling upon Auger's neck and pledging with him that brotherhood in arms, so dear and so sacred to the knights of old times. But Charlot, the emperor's son, at the sight of the glory with which Auger had covered himself, conceived the blackest jealousy and hate. The rest of the day and the next were spent in the rejoicings of the army. Turpin, in a solemn service, implored the favor of heaven upon the youthful knights, and blessed the white armor which was prepared for them. Duke Namo presented them with golden spurs. Charles himself girded on their swords. But what was his astonishment when he examined that intended for Auger? The loving fairy Morgana had had the art to change it, and to substitute one of her own procuring, and when Charles drew it out of the scabbard these words appeared written on the steel. My name is Cortana, of the same steel and temper, as Joyeuse and Durandana. Charles saw that a superior power watched over the destinies of Auger. 
He vowed to love him as a father would, and Auger promised him the devotion of his son. Happy had it been for both if they had always continued mindful of their promises. The Saracen army had hardly recovered from its dismay, when Carahue, king of Mauritania, who was one of the knights overthrown by Auger at the time of the rescue of Charlemagne, determined to challenge him to single combat. With that view, he assumed the dress of a herald, resolved to carry his own message. The French knights admired his air, and said to one another that he seemed more fit to be a knight than a bearer of messages. Carahue began by passing the warmest eulogium upon the knight who bore the oriflame on the day of the battle, and concluded by saying that Carahue, king of Mauritania, respected that knight so much that he challenged him to combat. Augier had risen to reply when he was interrupted by Charlot, who said that the gage of the king of Mauritania could not be fitly received by a vassal living in captivity by which he meant Auger, who was at the time serving as hostage for his father. Fire flashed from the eyes of Auger, but the presence of the emperor restrained his speech, and he was calmed by the kind looks of Charlemagne, who said with an angry voice, "'Silence, Charlot! By the life of Bertha, my queen! He who has saved my life is as dear to me as yourself. Auger,' he continued, "'you are no longer a hostage. Harold, report my answer to your master.' that never does a knight of my court refuse a challenge on equal terms. Auger the Danes accepts of his, and I myself am his security. Carahue, profoundly bowing, replied, My lord, I was sure that the sentiments of so great a sovereign as yourself would be worthy of your high and brilliant fame. I shall report your answer to my master, whom I know admires you, and unwillingly takes arms against you. Then, turning to Charlot, whom he did not know as the son of the emperor, he continued, as for you, Sir Knight, if the desire of battle inflames you, I have it in charge from Sadon, cousin of the King of Mauritania, to give the like defiance to any French knights who will grant him the honour of the combat. Charlot, inflamed with rage and vexation at the public reproof which he had just received, hesitated not to deliver his gage. Carahue received it with Auger's, and it was agreed that the combat should be on the next day in a meadow environed by woods, and equally distant from both armies. The perfidious Charlot meditated the blackest treason. During the night he collected some knights unworthy of the name, and like himself in their ferocious manners, he made them swear to avenge his injuries, armed them in black armour, and sent them to lie in ambush in the wood, with orders to make a pretended attack upon the whole party, but in fact to lay heavy hands upon Auger and the two Saracens. At the dawn of the day, Sedan and Carahue, attended only by two pages to carry their spears, took their way to the appointed meadow, and Charlot and Auger repaired thither also, but by different paths. Auger advanced with a calm air, saluted courteously the two Saracen knights, and joined them in arranging the terms of the combat. While this was going on, the perfidious Charlot remained behind, and gave his men the signal to advance. That cowardly troop issued from the wood and encompassed the three knights. All three were equally surprised at the attack, but neither of them suspected the other to have any hand in the treason. Seeing the attack made equally upon them all, they united their efforts to resist it, and made the most forward of the assailants bite the dust. Cortana fell on no one without inflicting a mortal wound, but the sword of Carahue was not of equal temper and broke in his hands. At the same instant his horse was slain, and Carahue fell without a weapon and entangled with his prostrate horse. Augier, who saw it, ran to his defence, and leaping to the ground covered the prince with his shield, supplied him with the sword of one of the fallen ruffians, and would have him mount his own horse. At that moment Charlot, inflamed with rage, pushed his horse upon Auger, knocked him down, and would have run him through with his lance, if Sedan, who saw the treason, had not sprung upon him and thrust him back. Carahue leapt lightly upon the horse, which Auger presented him, and they had time only to exclaim, "'Brave Auger, I am no longer your enemy. I pledge you an eternal friendship!' when numerous Saracen knights were seen approaching, having discovered the treachery, and Charlot, with his followers, took refuge in the woods." The troop which advanced was commanded by Danemont, the exiled king of Denmark, whom Geoffrey, Auger's father, had driven from his throne and compelled to take refuge with the Saracens. Learning who Auger was, he instantly declared him his prisoner, in spite of the urgent remonstrances and even threats of Carahue and Sadon, and carried him under a strong guard to the Saracen camp. 
Here he was at first subjected to the most rigorous captivity, but Carahue and Sidon insisted so vehemently on his release, threatening to turn their arms against their own party if it was not granted, while Danamount as eagerly opposed to the measure, that Corsabal, the Saracen commander, consented to a middle course, and allowed Ogier the freedom of his camp, upon his promise not to leave it without permission. Carahue was not satisfied with his partial concession. He left the city next morning, proceeded to the camp of Charlemagne, and demanded to be led to the emperor. When he reached his presence, he dismounted from his horse, took off his helmet, drew his sword, and holding it by the blade, presented it to Charlemagne as he knelt before him. "'Illustrious prince,' he said, "'behold before you the herald who brought the challenge to your knights from the king of Mauritania. The cowardly old king Danemont has made the brave Ogier prisoner, and has prevailed on our general to refuse to give him up. I come to make amends for this ungenerous conduct by yielding myself, Carahue, king of Mauritania, your prisoner. Charlemagne, with all his peers, admired the magnanimity of Carahue. He raised him, embraced him, and restored him his sword. Prince, said he, your presence and the bright example you afford my knights consoles me for the loss of Ogier. Would to God you might receive our holy face and be wholly united with us. All the lords of the court, led by Duke Namo, paid their respects to the king of Mauritania. Charlot only failed to appear, fearing to be recognized as a traitor, but the heart of Carahue was too noble to pierce that of Charlemagne by telling him the treachery of his son. Meanwhile the Saracen army was rent by discord. The troops of Carahue clamored against the commander-in-chief because their king was left in captivity. They even threatened to desert the cause and turn their arms against their allies. Charlemagne pressed the siege vigorously, till at length the two Saracen leaders found themselves compelled to abandon the city and betake themselves to their ships. A truce was made, Ogier was exchanged for Carahue, and the two friends embraced one another with vows of perpetual brotherhood. The Pope was re-established in his dominions, and Italy being tranquil, Charlemagne returned with his peers and their followers to France. End of chapter 24《ハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハCharlemagne had not forgotten the offence of Geoffrey, the king of Denmark, in withholding homage, and now prepared to enforce submission. But at this crisis he was waited upon by an embassy from Geoffrey, acknowledging his fault and craving assistance against an army of invaders who had attacked his states with a force which he was unable to repel. The soul of Charlemagne was too great to be implacable, and he took this opportunity to test that of Augier, who had felt acutely the unkindness of his father in leaving him, without regard or notice, fifteen years in captivity. Charles asked Augier whether, in spite of his father's neglect, he was disposed to lead an army to his assistance. He replied, A son can never be excused from helping his father by any cause short of death. Charlemagne placed an army of a thousand knights under the command of Augier, and great numbers more volunteered to march under so distinguished a leader. He flew to the succor of his father, repelled the invaders, and drove them in confusion to their vessels. Ogier then hastened to the capital, but as he drew near the city he heard all the bells sounding a knell. He soon learned the cause. It was the obsequies of Geoffrey the king. Ogier felt keenly the grief of not having been permitted to embrace his father once more, and to learn his latest commands. But he found that his father had declared him heir to his throne. He hastened to the church where the body lay. He knelt and bathed the lifeless form with his tears. At that moment a celestial light beamed all around, and a voice of an angel said, Ogier, leave thy crown to Guyon, thy brother, and bear no other title than that of the Dane. Thy destiny is glorious, and other kingdoms are reserved for thee. Ogier obeyed the divine behest. He saluted his stepmother respectfully, and embracing his brother, told him that he was content with his lot in being reckoned among the paladins of Charlemagne, and resigned all claims to the crown of Denmark. Ogier returned covered with glory to the court of Charlemagne, 
and the emperor, touched with this proof of his attachment, loaded him with caresses and treated him almost as an equal. We pass in silence the adventures of Ogier for several ensuing years, in which the fairy gifts of his infancy showed their force in making him successful in all enterprises, both of love and war. He married the charming Bellicine, and became the father of young Baldwin, a youth who seemed to inherit in full measure the strength and courage of his father and the beauty of his mother. When the lad was old enough to be separated from his mother, Ogier took him to court, and presented him to Charlemagne, who embraced him and took him into his service. It seemed to Duke Namo and all the elder knights, as if they saw in him Ogier himself, as he was in his youth, and this resemblance won for the lad their kind regards. Even Charlot at first seemed to be fond of him, though after a while the resemblance to Ogier which he noticed had the effect to excite his hatred. Baldwin was attentive to Charlot, and lost no occasion to be serviceable. The prince loved to play chess, and Baldwin, who played well, often made a party with him. One day Charlot was nettled at losing two pieces in succession. He thought he could, by taking a piece from Baldwin, get some amends for his loss, but Baldwin, seeing him fall into a trap which he had set for him, could not help a slight laugh as he said, Checkmate! Charlot rose in a fury, seized the rich and heavy chessboard, and dashed it with all his strength on the head of Baldwin, who fell and died where he fell. Frightened at his own crime, and fearing the vengeance of the terrible Auger, Charlot concealed himself in the interior of the palace. A young companion of Baldwin hastened and informed Auger of the event. He ran to the chamber and beheld the body of his child, bathed in blood, and it could not be concealed from him that Charlot gave the blow. Transported with rage, Auger sought Charlot through the palace, and Charlot, feeling safe nowhere else, took refuge in the hall of Charlemagne, where he seated himself at table with Duke Namo and Salomon, Duke of Brittany. Auger, with sword drawn, followed him to the very table of the emperor. When a cupbearer attempted to bar his way, he struck the cup from his hand and dashed the contents in the emperor's face. Charles rose in a passion, seized the knife, and would have plunged it into his breast, had not Solomon and another baron thrown themselves between, while Namo, who had retained his ancient influence over Auger, drew him out of the room. Foreseeing the consequence of this violence, pitying Auger and in his heart excusing him, Namo hurried him away before the guards of the palace could arrest him, made him mount his horse, and leave Paris. Charlemagne called together his peers and made them take an oath to do all in their power to arrest Auger and bring him to condign punishment. Auger, on his part, sent messages to the emperor, offering to give himself up on the condition that Charlot should be punished for his atrocious crime. The emperor would listen to no conditions and went in pursuit of Auger at the head of a large body of soldiers. Auger, on the other hand, was warmly supported by many knights who pledged themselves in his defence. The contest raged long with no decisive results. Auger more than once had the emperor in his power, but declined to avail himself of his advantage, and released him without conditions. He even implored pardon for himself, but demanded at the same time the punishment of Charlot. But Charlemagne was too blindly fond of his unworthy son to subject him to punishment for the sake of conciliating one who had been so deeply injured. At length, distressed at the blood which his friends had lost in his cause, Auger dismissed his little army, and slipping away from those who wished to attend him, took his course to rejoin the Duke Guyon, his brother. On his way, having reached the forest of Ardennes, weary with long travel, the freshness of a retired valley tempted him to lie down to take some repose. He unsaddled Befror, relieved himself of his helmet, lay down on the turf, rested his head on his shield, and slept. It so happened that Turpin, who occasionally recalled to his mind that he was Archbishop of Rhines, was at that time in the vicinity, making a pastoral visit to the churches under his jurisdiction. But his dignity of peer of France, and his martial spirit, which caused him to be reckoned among the pro chevaliers of his time, forbade him to travel without as large a retinue of knights as he had of clergymen. One of these was thirsty, and knowing the fountain on the borders of which Auger was reposing, he rode to it and was struck by the sight of a knight stretched on the ground. He hastened back and let the archbishop know, who approached the fountain and recognized Auger. The first impulse of the good and generous Turpin was to save his friend, for whom he felt the warmest attachment. But his archdeacons and knights, who also recognized Auger, reminded the archbishop of the oath which the emperor had exacted of them all. Turpin could not be false to his oath, but it was not without a groan that he permitted his followers to bind the sleeping knight. 
the archbishop's attendants secured the horse and arms of Auger and conducted their prisoner to the emperor at Soissons. The emperor had become so much embittered by Auger's obstinate resistance, added to his original fault, that he was disposed to order him to instant death, but Turpin, seconded by the good dukes Namot and Salomon, prayed so hard for him that Charlemagne consented to remit a violent death, but sentenced him to close imprisonment, under the charge of the archbishop, strictly limiting his food to one quarter of a loaf of bread per day, with one piece of meat, and a quarter of a cup of wine. In this way he hoped to quickly put an end to his life without bringing on himself the hostility of the king of Denmark and other powerful friends of Auger. He exacted a new oath of Turpin to obey his orders strictly. The good archbishop loved Auger too well not to cast about for some means of saving his life, which he foresaw he would soon lose if subjected to such scanty fare, for Auger was seven feet tall and had an appetite in proportion. Turpin remembered, moreover, that Auger was a true son of the church, always zealous to propagate the faith and subdue unbelievers. So he felt justified in practicing, on this occasion, what in later times has been entitled mental reservation, without swerving from the letter of the oath which he had taken. This is the method he hit upon. Every morning he had his prisoner supplied with a quarter of a loaf of bread, made of two bushels of flour. To this he added a quarter of a sheep or fat calf, and he had a cup made which held forty pints of wine, and allowed Auger a quarter of it daily. Auger's imprisonment lasted long. Charlemagne was astonished to hear from time to time that he still held out, and when he inquired more particularly of Turpin, the good archbishop, relying on his own understanding of the words, did not hesitate to affirm positively that he allowed his prisoner no more than the permitted ration. We forgot to say that when Auger was led prisoner to Soissons, the abbot of St. Farin, observing the fine horse Beffroir, and not having at the time any other favour to ask of Charlemagne, begged the emperor to give him the horse, and had him taken to his abbey. He was impatient to try his new acquisition, and when he had arrived in his litter at the foot of the mountain, where the horse had been brought to meet him, mounted him and rode onward. The horse, accustomed to bear the enormous weight of Auger in his armour, when he perceived nothing on his back but the light weight of the abbot, whose long robes fluttered against the sides, ran away, making prodigious leaps over the steep acclivities of the mountain, till he reached the convent of Joer, where, in sight of the abbess and her nuns, he threw the abbot, already half-dead with fright, to the ground. The abbot, bruised and mortified, revenged himself on poor Beffroir, whom he condemned, in his wrath, to be given to the workmen to drag stones for a chapel that he was building near the abbey. Thus, ill-fed, hard-worked, and often beaten, the noble horse Beffroir passed the time while his master's imprisonment lasted." that imprisonment would have been as long as his life, if it had not been for some important events which forced the emperor to set Auger at liberty. The emperor learned at the same time that Carahu, king of Mauritania, was assembling an army to come and demand the liberation of Auger, that Guyon, king of Denmark, was preparing to second the enterprise with all his forces, and worse than all that, that the Saracens, under Bruhir, sultan of Arabia, had landed in Gascony, taken Bordeaux, and were marching with all speed for Paris. Charlemagne now felt how necessary the aid of Auger was to him, but in spite of the representations of Turpin, Namau, and Salomon, he could not bring himself to consent to surrender Charlot to such punishment as Auger should see fit to impose. Besides, he believed that Auger was without strength and vigour, weakened by imprisonment and long abstinence. At this crisis he received a message from Bruhier, proposing to put the issue upon the result of a combat between himself and the emperor or his champion— promising, if defeated, to withdraw his army. Charlemagne would willingly have accepted the challenge, but his counsellors all opposed it. The herald was therefore told that the emperor would take time to consider his proposition, and give him answer the next day. It was during this interval that the three dukes succeeded in prevailing upon Charlemagne to pardon Auger, and to send for him to combat the puissant enemy who now defied him. But it was no easy task to persuade Auger. The idea of his long imprisonment and the recollection of his son bleeding and dying in his arms by the blow of the ferocious Charlot made him long resist the urgency of his friends. The glory called him to encounter Bruhier, and the safety of Christendom demanded the destruction of this proud enemy of the faith. Auger only yielded at last on condition that Charlot should be delivered into his hands to be dealt with as he should see fit. The terms were hard, but the danger was pressing and Charlemagne, with a returning sense of justice and a strong confidence in the generous though passionate soul of Auger, at last consented to them. Auger was led into the presence of Charlemagne by three peers. 
The emperor, faithful to his word, had caused Charlot to be brought into the hall, where the high barons were assembled, his hands tied and his head uncovered. When the emperor saw Auger approach, he took Charlot by the arm, led him towards Auger, and said these words, "'I surrender the criminal. Do with him as you see fit.' Auger, without replying, seized Charlot by the hair, forced him on his knees, and lifted with the other hand his irresistible sword. Charlemagne, who expected to see the head of his son rolling at his feet, shut his eyes and uttered a cry of horror. Auger had done enough. The next moment he raised Charlot, cut his bonds, kissed him on the mouth, and hastened to throw himself at the feet of the emperor. Nothing can exceed the surprise and joy of Charlemagne at seeing his son unharmed, and Auger kneeling at his feet. He folded him in his arms, bathed him with tears, and exclaimed to his barons, "'I feel at this moment that Auger is greater than I!' As for Charlot, his base soul felt nothing but the joy of having escaped death. He remained as he had been, and it was not till some years afterward he received the punishment he deserved from the hands of Huon of Bordeaux, as we have seen in a former chapter. End of Auger the Dane Continued Chapter 26 of Legends of Charlemagne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Morris. Legends of Charlemagne by Thomas Bullfinch. Auger the Dane. Continued. When Charlemagne had somewhat recovered his composure, he was surprised to observe that Auger appeared in good case, and had a healthy colour in his cheeks. He turned to the archbishop, who could not help blushing as he met his eye. "'By the head of Bertha, my queen,' said Charlemagne, "'Auger has had good quarters in your castle, my lord archbishop, but so much the more am I indebted to you.' All the barons laughed and jested with Turpin, who only said, "'Laugh as much as you please, my lords, but for my part I am not sorry to see the arm in full vigour that is to avenge us on the proud Saracen.' Charlemagne immediately dispatched his herald, accepting the challenge and appointing the next day but one for the encounter. The proud and crafty Bruhier laughed scornfully when he heard the reply accepting his challenge, for he had a reliance on certain resources besides his natural strength and skill. However, he swore by Mahomet to observe the conditions as proposed and agreed upon. Auger now demanded his armour, and it was brought to him in excellent condition, for the good Turpin had kept it faithfully. But it was not easy to provide a horse for the occasion. Charlemagne had the best horses of his stables brought out, except Blanchard, his own charger, but all in vain. The weight of Auger bent their backs to the ground. In this embarrassment the archbishop remembered that the emperor had given Beffroi to the abbot of St. Farron, and sent off a courier in haste to redemand him. Monks are hard masters, and the one who directed the labours at the abbey had but too faithfully obeyed the orders of the abbot. Poor Beffroi was brought back lean, spiritless, and chafed with the harness of the vile cart that he had had to draw for so long. He carried his head down and trod heavily before Charlemagne, but when he heard the voice of Auger, he raised his head, he neighed, his eyes flashed, his former ardour showed itself by the force with which he pawed the ground. Auger caressed him, and the good steed seemed to return his caresses. Auger mounted him, and Beffroi, proud of carrying his master again, leaped and curvetted with all his youthful vigour. Nothing being now wanted, Charlemagne, at the head of his army, marched forth from the city of Paris, and occupied the hill of Montmartre whence the view extended over the plain of St. Denis, where the battle was to be fought. When the appointed day came, the Duke de Snamon and Salomon, as seconds of Auger, accompanied him to the place marked out for the lists, and Bruhier, with two distinguished emirs, presented himself on the other side. Bruhier was in high spirits, and jested with his friends as he advanced, upon the appearance of Beffroi. Is that the horse they presume to match with Marjavali, the best steed that ever fed in the vales of Mount Atlas? But now the combatants, having met and saluted each other, ride apart to come together in full career. Brefroar flew over the plain and met the adversary more than half way. The lances of the two combatants were shivered at the shock, and Bruhier was astonished to see it almost at the same instant the sword of Auger gleaming above his head. He parried it with his buckler, and gave Auger a blow on his helmet, who returned it with another, 
better aimed or better seconded by the temper of his blade, for it cut away part of Bruhir's helmet, and with it his ear and part of his cheek. Auger, seeing the blood, did not immediately repeat his blow, and Bruhir seized the moment to gallop off at one side. As he rode, he took a vase of gold which hung at his saddle-bow, and bathed with its contents the wounded part. The blood instantly ceased to flow, the ear and the flesh were restored quite whole, and the Dane was astonished to see his antagonist return to the ground as sound as ever. Bruhir laughed at his amazement. No, said he, that I possess the precious balm that Joseph of Arimathea used upon the body of the crucified one, whom you worship. If I should lose an arm, I could restore it with a few drops of this. It is useless for you to contend with me. Yield yourself, and, as you appear to be a strong fellow, I will make you first oarsman in one of my galleys. Auger, though boiling with rage, forgot not to implore the assistance of heaven. O oh Lord! he exclaimed, suffer not the enemy of thy name to profit by the powerful help of that which owes all its virtue to thy blood. At these words he attacked Bruhir again with more vigour than ever. Both struck terrible blows and made grievous wounds. But the blood flowed from those of Auger, while Bruhir staunched his by the application of the balm. Auger, desperate at the unequal contest, grasped Cortana with both hands and struck his enemy such a blow that it cleft his buckler and cut off his arm with it but Bruhir, at the same time, launched one at Auger, which, missing him, struck the head of Beaufort, and the good horse fell and drew down his master in his fall. Bruhir had time to leap to the ground, to pick up his arm and apply his balsam. Then, before Auger had recovered his footing, he rushed forward with sword uplifted to complete his destruction. Charlemagne, from the height of Montmartre, seeing the brave Auger in this situation, groaned, and was ready to murmur against Providence, but the good Turpin, raising his arms, with a faith like that of Moses, drew down upon the Christian warrior the favour of heaven. Auger promptly disengaged himself, pressed Bruhir with so much impetuosity that he drove him to a distance from his horse, to whose saddle-bow the precious balm was suspended. And very soon Charlemagne saw Auger, now completely in the advantage, bring his enemy to his knees, tear off his helmet, and with a sweep of his sword strike his head from his body. After the victory, Auger seized Marchevalli, leaped upon his back, and became possessed of the precious flask, a few drops from which closed his wounds and restored his strength. The French knights, who had been Bruhir's captives, now released, pressed round Auger to thank him for their deliverance. Charlemagne and his nobles, as soon as their attention was relieved from the single combat, perceived from their elevated position an unusual agitation in the enemy's camp. They attributed it at first to the death of their general, but soon the noise of arms, the cries of combatants, and new standards which advanced, disclosed to them the fact that Bruhir's army was attacked by a new enemy. The emperor was right. It was the brave Carahue of Mauritania, who, with an army, had arrived in France, resolved to attempt the liberation of Auger, his brother-in-arms. Learning on his arrival the changed aspect of affairs, he hesitated not to render a signal service to the Emperor, by attacking the army of Bruhir in the midst of the consternation occasioned by the loss of its commander. Auger recognized the standard of his friend, and leaping upon Marchevalli, flew to aid his attack. Charlemagne followed with his army, and the Saracen host, after an obstinate conflict, was forced to surrender unconditionally. The interview of Auger and Carahue was such as might be anticipated of two such attached friends and accomplished knights. Charlemagne went to meet them, embraced them, and putting the king of Mauritania on his right and Auger on his left, returned with triumph to Paris. There the Empress Bertha and the ladies of her court crowned them with laurels, and the sage and gallant Egenhard, chamberlain and secretary of the emperor, wrote all these great events in his history. A few days after Guyon, king of Denmark, arrived in France with a chosen band of knights, and sent an ambassador to Charlemagne, to say that he came not as an enemy, but to render homage to him as the best knight of the time, and the head of the Christian world. Charlemagne gave the ambassador a cordial reception, and mounting his horse, rode forward to meet the king of Denmark. These great princes, being assembled at the court of Charles, held council together, and the ancient and sage barons were called to join it. It was decided that the united Danish and Mauritanian armies should cross the sea and carry the war to the country of the Saracens, and that a thousand French knights should range themselves under the banner of Auger the Dane, who, though not a king, should have equal rank with the two others. We have not space to record all the illustrious actions performed by Auger and his allies in this war. Suffice it to say, they subdued the Saracens of Ptolemais and Judea, 
and erecting those regions into a kingdom, placed the crown upon the head of Ogier. Guyon and Carahue then left him to return to their respective dominions. Ogier adopted Walter, the son of Guyon of Denmark, to be his successor in his kingdom. He superintended his education, and saw the young prince grow up worthy of his cares. But Ogier, in spite of all the honours of his rank, often regretted the court of Charlemagne, the Duke Namo and Solomon of Brittany, for whom he had the respect and attachment of a son. At last, finding Walter old enough to sustain the weight of government, Auger caused the vessel to be prepared secretly, and, attended only by one squire, left his palace by night and embarked to return to France. The vessel, driven by a fair wind, cut the sea with the swiftness of a bird, but on a sudden it deviated from its course, no longer obeyed the helm, and sped fast towards a black promontory which stretched into the sea. This was a mountain of lodestone, and, its attractive power increasing as the distance diminished, the vessel at last flew with the swiftness of an arrow towards it, and was dashed to pieces on its rocky base. Auger alone saved himself, and reached the shore on a fragment of the wreck. Auger advanced into the country, looking for some marks of inhabitancy, but found none. On a sudden he encountered two monstrous animals, covered with glittering scales, accompanied by a horse breathing fire. Auger drew his sword and prepared to defend himself, but the monsters, terrific as they appeared, made no attempt to assail him, and the horse, Papillion, knelt down and appeared to court Auger to mount upon his back. Auger hesitated not to see the adventure through. He mounted Papillion, who ran with speed, and soon cleared the rocks and precipices which hemmed in and concealed a beautiful landscape. He continued his course till he reached a magnificent palace, and, without allowing Auger time to admire it, crossed a grand courtyard adorned with colonnades, and entered a garden where, making his way through the alleys of Myrtle, he checked his course and knelt down on the enamel turf of a fountain. Auger dismounted and took some steps along the margin of the stream, but was soon stopped by meeting a young beauty, such as they paint the graces, and almost as lightly attired as they. At the same moment, to his amazement, his armour fell off of its own accord. The young beauty advanced with a tender air, and placed upon his head a crown of flowers. At that instant the Danish hero lost his memory, his combats, his glory, Charlemagne and his court, all vanished from his mind. He saw only Morgana. He desired nothing but to sigh for ever at her feet. We abridge the narrative of all the delights which Auger enjoyed for more than a hundred years. Time flew by, leaving no impression of its flight. Morgana's youthful charms did not decay, and Auger had none of those warnings of increasing years, which less favoured mortals never fail to receive. There is no knowing how long this blissful state might have lasted, if it had not been for an accident, by which Morgana one day, in a sportive moment, snatched the crown from his head. That moment Auger regained his memory and lost his contentment. The recollection of Charlemagne and of his own relatives and friends saddened the hours which he passed with Morgana. The fairy saw with grief the changed looks of her lover. At last she drew from him the acknowledgment that he wished to go, at least for a time, to revisit Charles's court. She consented with reluctance, and with her own hands helped to reinvest him with his armour. Papillion was led forth, Auger mounted him, and, taking a tender adieu of the cheerful Morgana, crossed at rapid speed the rocky belt which separated Morgana's palace from the borders of the sea. The sea-goblins which had received him at his coming awaited him on the shore. One of them took Auger on his back, and the other placing himself under Papillion, they spread their broad fins, and in a short time traversed the wide space that separates the Isle of Avalon from France. They landed Auger on the coast of Languedoc, then plunged into the sea and disappeared. Auger remounted on Papillion, who carried him across the kingdom almost as fast as he had passed the sea. He arrived under the walls of Paris, which he would scarcely have recognized if the high towers of St. Genevieve had not caught his eye. He went straight to the palace of Charlemagne, which seemed to him to have been entirely rebuilt. His surprise was extreme, and increased still more on finding that he understood with difficulty the language of the guards and attendants in replying to his questions, and seeing them smile as they tried to explain to one another the language in which he addressed them. Presently the attention of some of the barons, who were going to court, was attracted to the scene and Auger, who recognized the badges of their rank, addressed them and inquired if the dukes Namo and Solomon were still residing at the emperor's court. At this question the barons looked at one another in amazement, and one of the eldest said to the rest, "'How much this knight resembles the portrait of my grand-uncle, Auger the Dane!' "'Ah, my dear nephew!' 
I am Auger the Dane, said he, and he remembered that Morgana had told him that he was little aware of the flight of time during his abode with her. The barons, more astonished than ever, concluded to conduct him to the monarch who then reigned, the great Hugh Capet. The brave Auger entered the palace without hesitation, but when, on reaching the royal hall, the barons directed him to make his obeisance to the king of France, he was astonished to see a man of short stature and large head, whose heir nevertheless was noble and martial, seated upon the throne on which he had so often seen Charlemagne, the tallest and handsomest sovereign of his time. Auger recounted his adventures with simplicity and effectiveness. Hugh Capet was slow to believe him, but Auger recalled so many proofs and circumstances that at last he was forced to recognize the aged warrior to be the famous Auger the Dane. The king informed Auger of the events which had taken place during his long absence, that the line of Charlemagne was extinct, that a new dynasty had commenced, that the old enemies of the kingdom, the Saracens, were still troublesome, and that at that very time an army of those miscreants was besieging the city of Chartres, to which he was about to repair in a few days to its relief. Auger, always inflamed with a love of glory, offered the service of his arm, which the illustrious monarch accepted graciously, and conducted him to the queen. The astonishment of Auger was redoubled when he saw the new ornaments and headdresses of the ladies. Still, the beautiful hair which they built up on their foreheads, and the feathers interwoven which waved with so much grace, gave them a noble air that delighted him. His admiration increased when, instead of the old Empress Bertha, he saw a young queen who combined a majestic mead with the graces of her time of life, and manners candid and charming, suited to attach all hearts. Auger saluted the youthful queen with a respect so profound that many of the courtiers took him for a foreigner, or at least for some nobleman brought up at a distance from Paris, who retained the manners of what they called the old court. When the queen was informed by her husband that it was the celebrated Auger the Dane whom he presented to her, whose memorable exploits she had often read in the Chronicles of Antiquity, her surprise was extreme, which was increased when she remarked the dignity of his address, the animation and even the youthfulness of his countenance. The queen had too much intelligence to believe hastily. Proof alone could compel her assent, and she asked him many questions about the old court of Charlemagne, and received such instructive and appropriate answers as removed every doubt. It is to the corrections which Auger was at that time enabled to make to the popular narratives of his exploits that we are indebted for the perfect accuracy and trustworthiness of all the details of our own little history. King Hugh Capet, having received the same evening courtiers from the inhabitants of Chartres, informing him that they were hard pressed by the besiegers, resolved to hasten with Auger to their relief. Auger terminated this affair as expeditiously as he had so often done others. The Saracens having dared to offer battle, he bore the oriflamme through the thickest of their ranks, Papillion breathing fire from his nostrils threw them into disorder, and Cortana, wielded by his invincible arm, soon finished their overthrow. The king, victorious over the Saracens, led back the Danish hero to Paris, where the deliverer of France received the honors due his valor. Auger continued some time at the court, detained by the favor of the king and queen, but ere long he had the pain to witness the death of the king. Then it was that, impressed with all the perfection which he had discerned in the queen, he could not withhold the tender homage of the offer of his hand. The queen would perhaps have accepted it. She had even called a meeting of her great barons to deliberate on the proposition, when, the day before the meeting was to be held, at the moment when Auger was kneeling at her feet, she perceived a crown of gold which an invisible hand had placed on his brow, and in an instant a cloud enveloped Auger, and he disappeared for ever from her sight. It was Morgana the fairy, whose jealousy was awakened at what she beheld, who now resumed her power, and took him away to dwell with her in the island of Avalon. There, in company with the great King Arthur of Britain, he still lives, and when his illustrious friend shall return to resume his ancient reign, he will doubtless return with him and share his triumph. End of chapter 26 End of Legends of Charlemagne by Thomas Bullfinch